Hello, my name is Ashley Caldwell, and I'm the Vice President of Clinical Services and Workforce Development with the Illinois Primary Health Care Association. Today, I'm going to talk to you about what community health centers are and different examples of services that are provided through these important delivery systems. So who is IPHCA? So we are the sole primary care association for the state of Illinois. We were founded in 1982, and we receive funding from the Health Resources and Services Administration uh, to operate as the primary care association. So we are the primary care association um, with the goal of supporting community health centers and federally qualified health centers all across the state of Illinois. Who we represent. So our members are made up of Illinois Federally Qualified Health Centers, or FQHCs, in organizations with similar missions. In Illinois, the FQHC members that we have operate over 400 primary care, dental, mental health, and specialty service sites all across the state and also in bordering states of Iowa and Missouri. FQHCs are nonprofit organizations serving Medicaid, Medicare, uninsured, and privately insured patients. Our 400 clinics here in Illinois are serving in excess of 1.5 million patients annually. So this is an incredibly large care delivery system that many people do not know exist. The term FQHC and CHC or community health center are often used interchangeably, but FQHCs are actually funded by the federal government. So what are FQHCs? So really the difference between um, an FQHC or just a regular community clinic really is the funding and the designation of being an FQHC. So an, a federally qualified health center is going to provide services to patients regardless of their ability to pay. So when an uninsured patient comes in the door, they are seen no matter what, no matter what their payment type is, um, whether they want to self-pay with some cash, um, maybe they um, can't pay at all. So they're still seen. So when an uninsured patient again comes in, um, the clinic is going to ask for proof of their income, um, how much they make, um, and then they use a sliding fee scale to determine how much the patient is going to be asked to pay for their visit. So it could be that they're asked to pay $20 for their visit that day, but if the patient does have $20, they're still seen. So they are provided the services that they need regardless of whether they can pay, regardless of insurance status. Um, but they're not free clinics. So we always like to make that differentiation in that free clinics are an entirely different type of, of system. And, and um, you know, there aren't as many free clinics um, operating anymore. Um, but a health center, an FQHC, is not a free clinic because they do make a reasonable effort to secure payment from the patient. So um, again, they are going to have that fee schedule. Um, a sliding scale for primary care is different than a sliding scale for dental services um, in the clinic. So again, they are going to make an attempt to collect payment, but if the patient cannot pay, um, they're still gonna be seen. Um, patients can be turned away for a variety of other reasons, but it cannot be because of payment status. So some requirements of being an FQHC. So they're receiving this federal funding, which again is a small piece of their pie. Not, you know, we've mentioned federal funding. It is again, a very small piece of their pie, um, but it does help. So they have to be a public or private not-for-profit. 51% um, of their board members actually have to be users of the health center. So those are patient um, representatives on the board of directors. Um, this is a really unique example um, of a board of directors. You won't find this in other healthcare settings. Um, so for example, you could have a patient um, at a health center maybe who serves a lot of homeless patients um, who from time to time has been homeless. Um, and they could be sitting on this board of directors next to a hospital um, executive or a bank executive from the community. So um, it really is to bring people together to have that patient representation. And then it also is also, you know, giving back. So um, somebody who maybe hasn't had um, a professional experience before as a patient, you know, is, is getting to do that. They're on a board of directors. They're reviewing, you know, financial documents. They're, you know, participating in committees, making votes. So um, a really unique piece uh, of what our governing body looks like. No one is denied services on inability to pay. Um, health centers, FQHCs, must provide the full scope of primary care, which does include OB services. 
they have to provide preventive dental services. Um, if they do not, they have to be able to refer to a dentist who does. Um, FQHCs also have to have ongoing relationships with um, at least one hospital. Many of our clinics um, have relationships with many hospitals. Their um, providers admit their patients to the hospitals. Um, many of our providers also go in and, and work in the hospital. They can follow their patients. Um, so again, they have to have those relationships. Um, and they also have to have the referral relationships when a patient needs a specialist. So you have a patient who comes in, they're maybe underinsured or uninsured, um, and they need a colonoscopy. Um, the health center has to be able to refer them to someone who can provide that colonoscopy, but is also going to honor that the patient needs um, the colonoscopy on a sliding scale or a discount. Uh, they have to have quality improvement programs, um, mental health services. Again, this is something that's really growing for us, um, substance use disorder treatment. So if they're not doing those things, they have to be able to refer to someone who is. Um, the majority of, of the clinics um, here in Illinois are doing that now. And then they have to be located in what's known as the health professional shortage area. So the shortage criteria, and there are different types. So there's primary care shortages, dental shortages, and mental health shortages. So we are just going to talk about primary care. Um, basically, the entire count, the entire state of Illinois is basically all a shortage area um, at varying uh, degrees. So for primary care, they're going to look at um, a region's ratio to the primary care physicians to the population, the infant mortality rate and low birth weight for the population being served, percentage of the population at or below federal poverty level, uh, travel time to the nearest source of care. Um, and then for dental, they look at access to fluoridated water. Um, again, then there's a few other pieces of criteria for mental health, um, but they rank it in a, on a scale. So zero to up to 26 for dental, 25 for primary and mental. Um, we have many, many locations in Illinois that are 25s and 26s, so lots of high need areas. So again, you'll see we only show, I think, three counties in the entire state that have um, a shade of no, um, none of the county is a shortage area. Within that, though, there are still shortages. So the FQHCs that operate um, in that region, they also um, you know, as an FQHC come with what we call a HIPSA score. So just because it's identified as not having a shortage, um, the FQHCs in that community um, themselves actually as an FQHC have um, one of these scores. So um, this is something if you're interested in loan repayment programs, scholarship programs, um, as you move into those um, programs and as you advance through your education, um, this HIPSA scoring will become much more important. So services provided at an FQHC, obviously primary medical care. So most of our um, FQHCs are employing family physicians, pediatricians, internal medicine doctors, um, OBGYNs, psychiatrists. Um, occasionally we do have um, specialists, but again, that's kind of few and far between. But some of the larger clinics do have specialists, um, immunization and well child exams, dental, mental health services, substance use treatment, um, OB. We actually have, um, again, we mentioned that the, the clinics are providing OB services. We actually have a freestanding birth center that is um, run by an FQHC. Um, labs, radiology, so some health centers are doing, you know, mammography on site. Um, the COVID-19 testing and vaccination, FQHCs were actually some of the very first um, testing locations that were available to the public. So some of those very first, um, you know, walk up and drive up testing um, sites that you were seeing on TV were FQHCs. Um, and we had a very important role, you know, in rolling out vaccination as well. Uh, many clinics have on-site pharmacies. Um, if not, they have contract ph pharmacies. So Walgreens, Target, Walmart, CVS, places like that. Um, so they can offer the 340B drug discount program. Um, we do lots of case management. So again, when a patient needs food, when they need a refrigerator, when they need access to services in the community, um, we have case management services. Patient transportation, outreach, and enrollment. Um, that talks about, um, you know, navigating the marketplace for insurance. So helping a patient figure out if they qualify for Medicaid, um, helping them understand, you know, the health insurance marketplace, um, and then also maybe getting them enrolled for Medicaid. So we do a lot of navigation. 
um, patient education. Many of our um, clinics offer um, cooking classes, patient education classes, lots of diabetes education. Um, and some of the clinics have um, built mock grocery stores within their clinics. So, um, you know, fake food, um, grocery carts, they can actually sort of pretend they're grocery shopping and maybe the dietitian or a nutritionist can teach them how to read healthy, um, read food labels, how to shop for healthy food, you know, what choices to make in the grocery store. Um, like I said, cooking classes, um, fitness centers. So we have quite a few clinics that have started their own fitness centers. Some of the health centers offer aerobics, Zumba, yoga, um, really looking at a, um, you know, a patient's whole health. So who are underserved patients? So I'm gonna show a very um, brief video um, and then we'll talk a little bit about who's underserved. What determines how long we'll live? Is it what we do? Is it who we are? Actually, when it comes to predicting how long you'll live, your zip code is more important than your genetic code. Here's how this works. Meet Deb and Maria. They both have jobs. They're around the same age. They're both married and they both have two kids. Deb lives in A-Town while Maria lives in Beeville, less than one mile away. They're similar in so many ways, but here's the thing. On average, residents of Beeville will die more than 15 years sooner than the residents of A-Town. Why? Because where you live is about more than just your address. It's about your opportunities. For example, Deb and Maria's access to healthy options is really different. In A-Town, Deb's family is surrounded by healthy food options, including farmer's markets, specialty shops, and grocery stores. The air in A-Town is cleaner and fresher, and there are lots of safe, clean parks where Deb can exercise and her children can play. A-Town has good public schools for Deb's kids and easy access to emergency and preventive health care. On the other hand, Beeville has broken, badly lit sidewalks, and the parks are unsafe. The air is filled with truck exhausts from the nearby highway. And for food options, Maria's only choices are Beeville's many liquor stores, fast food places, or convenience stores. The schools in Beeville are overcrowded and undersupported. And even if Maria can get her kids into better schools far away, she needs to figure out how to get them there without access to a car. So for Maria, having to juggle so much to find healthy options can be an overwhelming source of chronic stress, which is a serious health risk factor. In fact, for all the residents of Beeville, chronic stress drives health problems like obesity, diabetes, asthma, and heart disease. How did A-Town and Beeville get so different? Well, in many cases in cities and towns across California, the root cause was racial and economic discrimination. Over the generations, poor white people and people of color were pushed to less desirable parts of town, where banks refused to lend money, businesses left, jobs too, schools declined, and the neighborhood crumbled. Everyone who could move away did. And what's more, when communities like A-Town and Beeville are so unequal, Beeville isn't the only one that suffers. Because it turns out that not only is your zip code a predictor of how long you'll live, so is what country you live in. Countries with the greatest income inequality have the lowest life expectancy. So even Americans like Deb, who are white, insured, college educated, and upper income, die younger than their peers in other countries. In fact, our life expectancy is 43rd in the world and that number is slipping. In the end, our biggest health risk may actually be inequality, and extreme inequality hurts us all. So what do we do? Well, if we're all going to be healthier, we don't just need to help the folks in Beeville beat the odds. We need to change the odds for everyone. And that's what we're doing. 
There's a movement happening. We're Californians. We don't follow. We lead. We are building the power to make health happen in communities across the state. We are coming together to build one California, a smarter, more inclusive and equitable state that creates health and opportunity for all of us. Join us. To learn more, visit buildinghealthycommunities.org. That obviously was a California specific example of, um, you know, a patient's social determinants of health. So how um, their social uh, surroundings, their environment, where they live, um, all impact their health. So that was a California example. It, it's a perfect example for here in Illinois as well. So we see this play out in all areas of the state, urban, rural. Um, and so they referenced, you know, transportation, pollution, um, you know, safe streets, um, access to healthy foods, all of those things impact a patient's health. And when we're thinking about that, we're thinking, you know, their primary care, so their body, um, their oral health care, their mental health care, um, you know, they were talking about chronic stress. Um, all of those things have, um, you know, are interrelated and they all impact someone's health and well-being. So, um, so when we talk about who is underserved, you know, underserved is, you know, means not having sufficient service um, or inadequate service, not being provided necessary or appropriate access. Um, so this can be someone even who has health insurance. So there's lots of patients that have health insurance that are underinsured. So while they have insurance, they still owe a lot of money for their copays or for their medicines or the, you know all of their appointments, and so they still may not be able to afford their health care. So um, you know you can be underinsured. Um, there are a variety of different types. You know when we think about populations, you know um, elderly can be um, you know our underserved populations. You know we have um, veterans that are underserved populations. Um, when we think about underserved. Um, many times patients that are, um, you know, living in public housing are underserved and um, we know public housing um, isn't always, you know, the best situation and we see high rates of asthma in populations living, you know, in public housing. Um, and so we also, you know, again, just thinking about distribution of, of resources and in a community. Um, so there are many ways that people can be underserved um, in rural areas. Um, you can be underserved because of how far it takes you to drive, how long the miles, um, you know, to access care, to access the care you need. Um, we have lots of maternity deserts. So again, hospitals that are no longer providing, you know, OB services and delivering babies, patients now have to drive even further. Um, and so there's a lot of different pieces to this, you know, ethnicity, um, you know, we see a lot of, um, you know, um, rates of higher rates of chronic disease in minority populations. Um, and when we look at, you know, what the community is like and do, you know, do patients have access to healthy foods um, and things like that, you know, we can see a lot of contributing factors. Um, so the importance of FQHCs. So um, FQHCs exist to serve underserved patients. So 72% um, of our patients are minorities. 95% um, have um, family incomes at or below 200% of the federal poverty level. 57% are on Medicaid, 7% are Medicare, and 21% of our patients are still uninsured. So even with um, the Affordable Care Act and access to health insurance, 21% of our patients still do not have health insurance. Um, but health centers exist to provide care to those patients and patients, again, who often, um, you know, have to access the emergency room. So many people are visiting the emergency department when they have an, an issue. And, and that is not primary care. And we know that that does not help a patient's health outcome. So um, finding someone a medical home um, where they can access the care that they need will prevent them from being in the emergency room and also then saves a lot of money. So um, for every um, dollar invested into the federally qualified health center program nationally, um, we generate almost $6 back into our communities between keeping people out of the emergency department, patients are healthy so they can go to work, which means they get a paycheck and they can spend money in their community. So again, when we think about economic impact, um, it's really huge. Um, but our patients are getting access to better women's health care. So uninsured and underinsured women are getting their breast exams and their pap smears. Um, our patients um, who need 
substance use treatment are getting access to the services that they need. Um, and then the spending is less. So we are actually doing more with, with the money, with less money. So when we think about Medicaid, we think about getting money from, you know, the state and federal governments, um, we are doing higher quality care with less money. So um, really a tremendous source of care, high quality care that many people don't, don't know exist. Um, and I just also want to point out, often um, there are FQHCs in your community, and you don't know that they're anything different than, than the normal doctor's office down the street. Um, and that's perfectly fine. That's awesome, because that means you don't, you know, you are just going to your regular doctor's office. So um, it's always um, really interesting when students find out that they know of an FQHC and just never knew that it had all these important services and sort of what it exists to do. So. We always like to share that information. So how can you serve the underserved? So there's lots of reasons that someone might be interested in working with underserved populations. Maybe it's a personal experience. Um, maybe you just have a mission for underserved and working with patients um, in need. Um, or again, maybe you wanna be part of making change, um, helping your local community be healthy, healthier. So um, I think those are all great reasons, um, and just a few of the reasons that we see people choose to work with underserved populations. So we just like to highlight some potential career career tracks um, that are available. So there are um, medical careers like doctor, dentist, a physician assistant, a nurse, or a nurse, um, advanced nurse practitioner, um, medical assisting, that is a very high need role. There's also lab techs, um, care coordinators, care managers, case managers, um, lots of positions in the behavioral health field are growing. So social workers, psychologists, we need counselors, substance use prevention counselors, um, but there's also lots of administrative careers. So maybe you're somebody who's interested in healthcare, but maybe you yourself aren't, aren't wanting to be a doctor. You don't wanna be a, de a nurse, a dentist. Um, there's plenty of careers. So we need health IT. Um, that is such a huge growing um, you know, need within our, um, within our industry. Um, we need managers, we need HR staff, um, we need marketing people, billing and coding, finance. Um, somebody also has to be a CEO, so we need executive roles. So there are just a huge variety of positions available, um, and a lot of health centers um, teach and train. So somebody who maybe starts as a front desk worker um, can work their way up, and maybe they become a medical assistant, and then maybe they go on and become a nurse. So there's a lot of career laddering um, that happens within our health centers as well. So some of the benefits of working for an FQHC include working in that service-oriented practice environment. So you're helping those who need you most. Um, our clinics are available and have opportunities for federal and state loan repayment programs and scholarship programs. Um, I'll touch on that in just a minute, but um, work-life balance, regular schedule hours, I mentioned career advancement, um, competitive pay, full benefits, time off, holidays, all of those things. Um, but thinking about um, state and federal loan repayment, if you are someone that's interested in one of those advanced degrees, so maybe it's um, a physician, you know, some of the advanced nursing roles, physician assistant, um, dental, uh, behavioral health, if you're interested in some of those careers that do require um, advanced schooling beyond, um, you know, the four-year bachelor's level, um, there are a lot of loan repayment and scholarship programs available. So um, when you're in your undergraduate work and you're um, doing those programs and thinking about what you want to do next, keep these in mind because you can apply for scholarships that can pay for your physician assistant school, for dental school, um, nursing programs. Um, so there are scholarships out there that will provide that tuition coverage. Um, and then in return, when you're finished, you work in an underserved area of your choosing um, to serve back that, that sort of that um, commitment. So you're sort of repaying that um, obligation. There are also loan repayment programs. So for somebody who had to take loans out for undergrad, for, you know, maybe medical school, for nursing school. Um, so when you're finished with your with your work and you have your, um, you know, your medical license, your nursing license, and you're ready to start working, you know, in your professional field, um, you can apply for these loan repayment programs, which give you tax-free money 
um, to pay back your loans. So our loan repayment programs range anywhere from $50,000 to $100,000 um, in tax-free money to pay back those student loans. So we know that there are lots of financial barriers um, for students in pursuing many of these careers. Um, so we want you to know that there are many options. Um, if you have any questions about loan repayment, scholarship programs, um, and various programs like that that exist, um, please reach out to us and we can point you in the right direction um, and suggest some things for you to start searching for and looking into um, at this point in your career. So I mentioned a couple of the loan repayments. Um, this is the National Health Service Corps loan repayment. Um, these are the eligible disciplines. These range again from fifty dollars to $100,000 in awards. Um, and these are all programs that you participate in after you've completed your advanced um, education. There are um, Illinois specific programs. So again, these are for advanced degree um, positions. But again, so there's there's national programs where you can work anywhere in the country, um, including Illinois. Um, there are several state options. So for people who are staying in Illinois, there's multiple options um, for loan repayment here as well. And then the scholarships. So again, this one, the National Health Service Corps or NHSC, um, they basically just say that you have to work in a health professional shortage area, which we, um, that HIPSA, which we talked about at the beginning. So um, these are, again, advanced degree, but this NHSC example on the slide and then the Nurse Corps Scholarship Program, these are just two examples of what exists out there for someone interested in pursuing advanced um, healthcare education. So I would just encourage you to do your research to find um, programs in your state. Um, if you're staying in Illinois, if you're here, um, you know, from Illinois, um, we can definitely direct you to more resources that are available. Um, there's lots of great programs to support students while they're in school, while they're in their undergraduate school, um, and we are happy to connect you with resources um, moving forward. So thank you so much. And I hope you find our program informative. Thank you.